Carbone from uh, uh, the University of uh, Rome. So Guelfo Carbone holds a PhD in philosophy and history of philosophy uh, and is tutor in moral philosophy at the University of Rome. Of Rome. Uh, Carbone's research interests are uh, reflected by his publications, uh, Lie and Phenomenology, Ethics, Philosophy of Technology, and Philosophy of Religion. Uh, he's a member of the editorial board of the philosophical journal Polymos and Materials of Philosophy and Social Criticism and of post facto a transdisciplinary journal. His latest book is devoted to the interplay between ethics and ontology and the philosophical paths of Martin Heidegger and Emmanuel Levinas. So, uh, well, for, uh, we are looking forward to hear your presentation. Hello, just checking in with the microphone. Can you hear me? Yes, everything is fine. We're here very well. Thanks. Okay. First of all, thank you so much, Felix, Tatiana, and Davina, for this opportunity. I would like to uh, um, uh, state a couple of preliminary remarks. One is uh, about methodology. Um, I have no slide to share, uh, just an old-fashioned uh, reading. <laughs> that will uh, take approximately uh, 25 or 30 minutes or so. And the second one um, is that this talk is quite experimental for me because uh, it's about an ongoing uh, research that I just started uh, about the figure of Janine Boissounous, uh, French historian and journalist, as I will uh, explain later. Uh, that is not very uh, well known. And I would like to, um, uh, to foster the, uh, the, 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 the knowledge of her works, first of all, and of, of her life, uh, uh, which is a life of a communist under the uh, Nazi occupation of Paris, 1940-1944. Uh, 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 the title of the the talk is A Diary of War and Persecution, Janine Boissounous and the Anti-Nazi Resistance in Paris. In 1945, uh, Jean-Paul Sartre and uh, Simon de Beauvoir, together with Raymond Aron and uh, Maurice Merleau-Ponty, among others, founded the journal Les Temps Modernes. The first volume of the second year of activity, issued in January 1946, collects three articles related to the catastrophic situation of Germany right after the World War. These articles include two testimonies about the German philosopher Martin Heidegger, authored by Maurice de Gandillac and Frederic de Tovarnitsky. These two articles reporting the encounters with a famous thinker that took place immediately after the war are well known. However, the section of the issue of the volume in which they are presented, entitled Document, is opened by some excerpts taken from a diary. The author of this diary is the French historian, novelist, and film critique Janine Boissounous. These materials, are, as well as the author, are less known than the other documents, but are in turn extremely valuable also for the testimony of that very moment of distress for Europe. The editorial note placed before Boissounous notes explains that the publication of the diary was forthcoming under the title Maison Occupée, Occupied Home. The excerpts last from end of February 1942 to August 1944 and are entitled Trois Allemands contre l'Allemagne, which we can translate Free Germans, Free German People Against Germany. The title refers to free anti Nazi Germans that Wassounous had the chance to meet in Paris and to which she refers by their first names, reporting just the initial letters of the surname. 
In what follows, I will outline Boissonneau's account of the Nazi occupation right until the liberation of Paris by the Allies in August 1944, with a focus on a gradual liaison with these free anti-Nazi Germans connected to the French, to the French resistance. Free anti-Nazi anti Germans. First, a brief account of Boissonneau's education and biography is in order. For her, the hints that I report here, for the hints that I report here, I rely on the important autobiographical source called uh, entitled La Nuit d'Auton, a novel issued in 1977, uh, and on the works of uh, a scholar named Olivier Forlain. Some data are found online, especially at the portal of French genealogy or in the biographical dictionary of the workers' movement and the social movement called Les Métrons. Janine Boissonneuse was born in 1903 as Janine Adèle Joséphine Boissonneuse. Her death is registered in 1978. She studied history and art history at the Sorbonne and at the École du Louvre in Paris, with a particular inclination toward the avant-gardist movements, especially surrealism. Her last memoir of 1977 accounts for the friendship with Paul Eluard, Max Ernst, Salvador Dali, and Sergei Eisenstein. Once completed her studies, cinematographic art appears to be her principal commitment, with a particular inclination for Soviet cinema works. She also appears in the 1929 movie by Eisenstein, entitled The Storming of La Sarras. As a journalist, she used to work with a number of literary journals and magazines, mostly left-oriented, such as L'Intransigeant, where she published, published in 1936 reports of the women condition in Soviet countries after uh, her journey held in 1935. She travels a lot, and she has a chance to experience the ongoing historical profound transformation, especially the authoritarian turn of many European societies in that period. She also meets leading politicians of her time, as in the occasion of the collective interview uh, to Mussolini at Palazzo Venezia in Rome, conducted for the magazine VU in 1933, or in the occasion of the lunch in Rome in 1946 with the socialist leader Pietro Nenni, prominent figure of the Italian anti-fascist movement during the regime, and Palmiro Togliatti, at that time secretary of the Italian Communist Party. Boissonneuse is firmly communist, and her engagement for the communist cause remains steady for her whole life although her intellectual support for the party uh, varies in forms and means. As the war ends, she moves to Rome in Italy for two years, 1945-1947, with her husband, Louis de Villefosse. Her, her husband, Louis, had been appointed to the, uh, the Ville Eternelle to Rome, in order to participate in the executive duties of the inter ally Committee for the Armistice signed with Italy. In Rome, she was very active in creating contacts between Italian and French intellectuals. Olivier Forlain recalls that starting with the liberation of Paris from the Nazi occupation, communist intellectuals, both from the periphery of the um, French Communist Party and the, uh, the ones gravitating outside the party shared a common interest for the Italian communist colleagues. After the war, they look to Italy for an open-minded, non-dogmatic Marxism, and a number of the Italian communist intellectuals seems to satisfy this demand. In the case of the collaboration between Elio Vittorini, 
and Sartre and de Beauvoir, they plan to devote an issue of the journal Temps Moderne to the Italian post-fascist social and intellectual condition. This issue will appear in August, September 1946, divided into three sections, respectively entitled Critique, War, and Crisis. In her uh, 1977 autobiographical memoir, Boissounous vividly recalls the arduous gestation of this issue. In 1946, Sartre and de Beauvoir traveled to Milan, from, sorry, from Milan to Rome, where they meet Boissounous and her husband. After a day trip to um, a very famous place in Italy, in South Rome, that is called Castelli Romani, uh, they have dinner with Ranuccio Bianchi Bandinelli, an Italian archaeologist and director of the journal Società, with Ambrogio Donini, who is a member of this, uh, this journal, and the communist painter and writer Carlo Levi. With a pinch of regret, Boisson News reports that the issue as it was planned at that dinner by their home would have never seen the light of day since the editorial team of Società, especially Donini, will retrieve their availability due to, I quote, I quote due to the anti-Soviet positions assumed by Sartre, end of quote. Eventually, other than being the only woman authoring a chapter in that issue, she will be the only French contributor in the free section devoted to Italy of this 1946 issue of Temp Moderne, along with Franco Fortini, Alberto Moravia, Ignazio Silone, and Carlo Levi, all prominent figure, intellectual figures of the uh, communist large area, post-war communist large area. It, it is worth to spend a couple of sentences more on Ranuccio Bianchi Bandinelli, friend of Boissounous that she met in Rome, thanks to Paul Eluard. A recent rather successful document, documentary devoted to Bianchi Bandinelli in, in Italy has been given a telling title, I quote, the man who didn't change the history. Indeed, in 1938, as Hitler's journeys to Italy was approaching, uh, Adolf Hitler's journey to Italy, due to his mastery of both art history and the German language, Bianchi Bandinelli was asked to guide the Führer in this planned visit to museums and monuments in Florence and in Rome in order to showcase the Italian beauties to the ally in the Axis. As a matter of fact, Mussolini too should have joined the visit. In his diary published in 1948, Bianchi Bandinelli reports some secret notes dating back to that occasion, in which he fantasized about the chance he had to plan an assassination attempt of both dictators all at once, in the same day, in the same occasion. Uh, relying on the strict schedule of the journey that he would have known in advance, and taking advantage of the scarce search controls on his person that could wear explosive and arm and weapons, okay? So, during her communist life, Janine Boissounous liaised with both the men who didn't change the history, like Bandinelli, such a, but also with men and women who did change the course of history such as Togliatti and um, a revolutionary, Ukrainian revolutionary uh, woman called Angelika Balabanov. It was a very interesting character. Maybe we should, we can uh, expand uh, upon her in the Q&A session. Um, Boissounous was also very close to those who did attempt, who did make the attempt in the darkest hour to reroute the course of what seemed an inescapable doom for the European civilization altogether. 
such is the case of the free the free germans against germany here germany refers to the greater german reich ruled by nazis whereas the free germans are the anti-Nazi Germans that Boissonneuse met in Paris during the war occupation. In the diary, they are reported as Wilhelm B, Werner H, and simply Frederick. As we later learn in the fifth chapter, chapter of her 1977 memoir, the chapter is entitled La Guerre et mes amis allemands, the war and my German uh, friends. Their complete and real names of this resistance of these uh, anti-Nazi Germans were Willem Blanke, Werner Hirsch, and Arthur Grosse. In the 1946 article, uh, Boisson News collects some excerpts from her diary, and these excerpts span from February 1942 to August 1944. The diary issued by Gallimard later in 1946 begins, however, with a note dated July 15, 1940, in which she describes her home, Maison Occupé, occupied home, in near Paris, occupied by 18 Nazi soldiers who put photos of Hitler all over the place. As they invaded Paris, they occupy her home and place photos of the, the dictator or the Führer all over the place. The diary ends on Sunday, August 27th, 1944, namely two days after the liberation of Paris uh, from the Nazi occupation, and the most important for her, homecoming of her husband, Louise, who come back home, came back home after the war. In that day, she writes at the end of the diary, the their home of her and her husband is fully occupied again. But we read between the lines that the occupation of their home takes an entirely different meaning, different meaning, a meaning of freedom, joy, and celebration. And once the celebration day is over, as she recalls in her later memoir, her husband and his comrades can begin the hunt of the Nazis hidden in the nearby woods. Maison Occupé is a diary of war and persecution. persecution. And the, as the author recalls, has been started to let her husband know how life was under occupation. The diary is therefore dedicated to her husband. It provides, the diary, an account of Boissonneau's daily life in Paris under the Nazi occupation and during the French regime of uh, Vichy. The diary includes accounts of her studying at the National Library during the war, as well as the endless weeks of struggle Crockroaches and hunger in March 1943, one of the worst period that she notes down. We can also read of the anguished wait for the messages from her husband from abroad. The, her husband was during the war a communist navy officer, a member of the anti Nazi resistance, serving in England with the Flotte Francaise Libre. Well-known intellectual figures of her time, such as André Gide, François Mauriac, and André Mar Malraux, are also mentioned in the pages of, their, of her diary. Her philosophical interests in wartime are noticeable too. With one of the free anti-Nazi Germans, with Hirsch, she discusses Nietzsche, Marx, and Martin Buber. Plato, and the differences between the Platonic Eros and the Christian notion of love were sometimes the focus of their conversations. Along with the consideration on the misery 
of war and its horrors, which are found scattered all over these pages, the diary reports some crucial events in the war, of the war, such as the arrival of the Nazi in Paris, when in July 1941, some writings of momentary victory appeared on the walls of the House of Democracy, namely the Chamber of Deputies, where uh, the Nazi wrote, uh, Deutschland siegt allen Fronten, Germany wins on all fronts. The end of the losing Nazi campaign in Russia with the huge battle of Stalingrad is also reported. Or later, the landing in, of the Allies in Sicily in uh, July 1943, where the liberation of Italy from fascism be, uh, began with the civil war in Italy. Boissonneuse also reports the first dreadful signs of the mass persecution of the Jews. I quote, the persecution against the Jews begins. We read in a note dating back to October 1940. Of course, she's uh, uh, referring to the Paris situation. Uh, what seemed far away, she writes, when it was in Berlin, it is now happening here in Paris, end of quote. The wall of China, she uses this, this uh, uh, um, wonderful expression, the wall of China of the European civilization that French people supposed was still separating them from the German Nazis has fallen. So there's no more difference, she says, from Nazi and, and French governors. At this point, on the wall of the windows of the shop, one can read, this place is Jewish. In May 1941, she noticed for the first time in a bar in Montparnasse, the, the sign reserved to, uh, uh, to Aryans. In the 1977 memoir, she also recalls, I quote, the horrible summer of 1942, which brought the methodical persecution of the Jews and imposed the yellow star to them, end of quote. A year after the occupation in Paris, in September 12, 1941, her journal reports the decisive circumstance, the first contact with the resistance. A friend of her, he, uh, simply called B in the diary, she is B. Uh, she is Banin Tillet. Introduces to her the anti Nazi German, it's, that's a quote, anti Nazi German, described by Bassonus as follows He's a guy in his 40s, a bit fat, surely not stupid, but not an intellectual at all. And with respect to politics, he is well informed, and he is also an uh, observer and a curious person. Upon the first encounter, Bassonus learns some strategic projects of the Nazi on the Western battlefront. But she also learns uh, that what, what these anti-Nazi German were effectively doing in the resistance. Um, the anti-Nazi German makes himself available to deliver a letter to her husband, Louis. But Boissonneuse in that first encounter, that first meeting, answered evasively. Since at this stage, she, do not, she does not trust him enough. This was the first encounter with Wilhelm Blanke. Blanke was appointed as a translator at the German military command center in Paris. As we read in the 1977 memoir, he hated Hitler both as a founder of a new religion and as a tyrant. A tyrant who had brought she, uh, he says to, to Janine Bostunuz, a tyrant who had brought um, Germany back to Druidic times. For similar reasons, he hated the novelist and philosopher Ernst Junger too. As Bostunuz met Blanc at the end of summer 1941, she began to increasingly share his huge risks by putting him in contact with French resistance. resistance. She was 
uh, liaising from uh, anti-Nazi German to French resistance. Blanc, Blanc had the purpose to point out to the enemies of the Nazi Germany, to the French resistance, resistance, some strategic places to bomb, such as industrial plants and military hangars. He forged also fake documents with the official stamp of his military office and was planning to make some detainees out of the prison of Paris by imitating the signature of their superiors. In 1944, he is sentenced to death due to the help provided to the French movement or resistance. As Boissonneuse herself recalled in 1977, I quote, Blanque had to pay his contribution to our resistance with his own life, end of quote. In May 1941, Boissonneuse gets to know a second anti-Nazi German, Werner H., namely Werner Hirsch. Hirsch is a friend of Blanque. They dispute on the outcome of war. They ponder the, they ponder the military forces at play. They see a debacle similar to 1918 coming. Hirsch lived a terrible dilemma. On the one hand, in case of vict victory of the Nazis, he fears the complete dissolution of, of Germany, the complete vanishing of all he as German lots and he foresees a Europe organized according to the Hitlerian doctrine. On the other hand, if Germany loses the war, Hirsch knows that there will be no more Germany for Germans. And all he loved of the German culture will be forgotten, such as Goethe or Novalis, a patient that he has in common with Boissonneuse. All um, I am reporting is from the diary, from the notes that she takes in the diary. After the war in March 1946, and we are coming to the conclusion. After the war in March 1946, Arthur Grosse, the third anti-Nazi German she met, will let Boissonneuse know that Hirsch has been killed in battle two years earlier, but no evidence or other information could be retrieved about him. As Boissonneuse notes, I quote, Hirsch, a sort of saint is dead as he lived, without leaving a trace, end of quote. It was Werner Hirsch that introduced to Boissonneuse Arthur Grosse, that is called in the diary simply Frédéric. He was from uh, Frédéric or, or Arthur Grosse was from the Black Forest in the southeast western part of Germany, close to the French border. The Comrade Grosse, as she calls him in the diary, the Comrade Frédéric, of course, the Comrade Frédéric makes a very vivid first impression on Boissonneuse. We read in her notes that he was, I quote, painter by vocation, businessman by duty, end of quote, and that he reads Steinbeck and Faulkner, and he attended mass every Sunday, is Catholic, uh, as most of the people in Baden-Württemberg from where he was from. Grosse is active in the forgery of fake official documents and permissions. In 1944, he underwent an interrogation due to a counterfeited permission. The outcome of the interrogation involves Boissonneuse too. Our Janine Boissonneuse was involved too in this interrogation. She will be for sure called and examined by the Gestapo, says Frederick at the phone after his own interrogation. So, Frédéric asks her for a meeting along the Champs-Élysées. They meet at a usual place, at the base of the marble group known as Marley Horses, Les Chevaux de Marly. This group of statues of the Champs-Élysées gives the title to the second part of the 1946 diary, which is, of course, entitled Les Chevaux de, de Marly. Uh, Grosse and Boissonneuse answer to a brief jointed questioning by the Gestapo. Gestapo was the, um, 
secret military police uh, of the Nazis. Once they are far away from the ears of the Gestapo, Gross gives her precise instructions on how to behave during her own interrogation by the Gestapo, which took place of a couple of days later, on the 29th of July, 1944. That is, less than a month before the liberation of Paris from Nazi occupation. Boissonneuse can manage to go through the interrogation very well. And she, as we read in the diary, she is free to go, although she is under surveillance. Grosse will also inform Boissonneuse that Blanque has been arrested and sentenced to death a few weeks earlier, in June 1944. But he has not, um, uh, Grosse has not any further information on his friend. As Boissonneuse writes in the 1977 uh, memoir, Boissonneuse will have to wait almost 30 years before finding out from the nephews of uh, Blanc that he was hanged in Brandenburg near Berlin at the end of 1944. And Boissonneuse regrets that his name, the name was Willem Blanc, cannot be found in any history of resistance. I thank you for your attention very much. <laughs>